Welcome everybody. Um, hello and thank you all for joining this workshop on the sources and impacts of sediment on kelp in, in Sussex. It's great to see so many turning up. We've got a huge range of stakeholders today. Um, I'm Sam, Sam Fanshaw, UK Marine Projects Manager for Blue Marine Foundation and a member of the Sussex Kelp Restoration Project Steering Group that's convened this event with the support of the People's Postcode Lottery. As we have such a wide range of attendees, some of whom may be new to the Sussex Kelp Restoration Project, I just want to provide a bit of background to what we're doing and the bigger picture. Next slide, please. We know that kelp once stretched along 40 kilometres of the West Sussex coastline from Selsey to Shoreham, extending at least four kilometres out to sea. The kelp provided a vital habitat, nursery and feeding ground for seahorses, cuttlefish, lobster, sea bream and bass. And kelp also acts as a carbon conveyor, drawing down carbon and potentially aiding in the fight against climate change, while feeding coastal ecosystems, improving water quality and reducing coastal erosion by absorbing the power of ocean waves. However, over the last 50 years, kelp in Sussex waters diminished to almost nothing. Storm damage, trawling, sediment, climate change and runoff have potentially contributed to the loss of this sensitive habitat. Although a number of factors could have been affecting the regrowth of the kelp forests, fishing with bottom toed gear is a manageable factor that was identified for action and the Sussex IFCA nearshore trawling bylaw, which excludes trawling from over 300 square kilometers of seabed off the Sussex coast was introduced in March, 2021. The implementation of this bylaw removes a key pressure from the area, giving kelp a chance to recover. And the Sussex Kelp Restoration Project aims to work with everyone who has a role to play in supporting that recovery. Next slide, please. Now, the Sussex Kelp Restoration Project is a collaboration between conservation, fisheries, research, communications and statutory organisations with a vision to champion, study and facilitate the restoration of the Sussex kelp to support a thriving and sustainable marine ecosystem. Next slide, please. Now we have a number of aims that are shown on this slide, but today's um, event is very, very much focusing on the one highlighted in red, which is to identify and minimize damaging impacts on existing and potential kelp habitat. Next slide, please. Now the nearshore trawling bylaw has removed one of the damaging impacts on kelp habitats bottom toed fishing gear. However, other factors may hinder the natural recovery of those kelp beds. One of these factors is sediment from various land-based riverine and marine sources. And this map aims to show you how all of those come together. And it was in your pre-workshop pack, so you can have a look at it in more detail at your, your leisure. But just to run through it, the outline in purple is of the bylaw area. The marine protection designations such as marine conservation zones and special areas of con conservation are highlighted in blue. The Rampion Wind Farm uh, is currently is, its current footprint is, is outlined in, in yellow and that will almost potentially double with Rampion 2 development. And then in the purple hashed areas are the aggregate dredging areas that are licensed and in green hashed are the areas where dredge disposal licenses are active. So we have quite a big one on um, in the east off Nab Tower, and then two smaller ones, one off Shoreham and one off Beachy Head West and New Haven. So this workshop aims to bring together the stakeholders to share information about the known sources and impacts of sediment on kelp and other marine life and identify areas for further investigation or potential collaboration. And without further ado, we're very fortunate to have the support of Diana and Rob from Way Forward Brighton, who will be facilitating this workshop today. And so I'd just like to hand over to Diana now, who'll give you an outline of the event and how we can all work together. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Hi, I'm Diana. I'm from Way Forward, a consultancy and agency serving the not-for-profit sector. Together with my colleague, Rob, will be facilitating your workshop today. Um, now, a quick reminder of who's in the room today and all the various stakeholders involved in this project, from charities to fishing associations, universities to government agencies, local authorities to community groups and so forth. In fact, today we have represented from over 25 different organizations and each of you bring your own roles, 
responsibilities and perspectives. So it's really important to remember that all of us here share the same aim, to restore the kelp and with it, the ecosystems and ecoservices that benefit nature, people and planet. Now we're here to talk about sedimentation because it's an issue that many of you have raised as a concern. And as we're due to hear from our speakers, it's also a complex topic. The sources of harmful sedimentation are multifold. Yes, they can be man-made, but they can also be natural. They can be direct or indirect. They can be as a result of a single source and also as from a combination of multiple random factors. Whatever the outcome, how we begin to address this concern and mitigate the harmful impacts of sedimentation has to be rooted in the science and in evidence-based approaches. And as a vital step towards that, today is all about the data. Specifically, what data do we have? What data don't we have that would be useful? And how might we work together to produce or use the data we have most effectively? In so doing, by the end of this workshop, which is a standalone activity, we hope to have enabled a collective understanding of this complex topic, identified the gaps in that understanding and created new connections between the diverse resources, knowledge and initiatives that you bring with you. It is through the data and it's through collaboration that we can direct future efforts where they're gonna have the most value and impact. I'm just going to quickly take you through the agenda. So initially, we're going to hear from nine brilliant speakers who are going to be sharing their insights into segmentation and the various projects they're involved in. We'll then break into five smaller groups for discussion and to answer some questions. Each group has a pre-assigned spokesperson who will be sharing um, your top line findings with the rest of us in the feedback sessions. There's also a five minute comfort break um, at 4.15 p.m. Now, a few housekeeping points. Um, firstly, if we've got a lot to cover, we need to be strict on timing. So please don't take offense if we hurry you on. We do so only to ensure um, that we've got enough time for those really important breakout sessions. Um, that means our presenters won't be able to take questions while they're on screen, but um, if uh, you have a question for them, please do utilize the chat function. Um, they may be able to give you a written answer later on. Um, also use the chat function if there's something that you really want to say but haven't had a chance to say it. Uh, we'll be monitoring that conversation and if there's a topic that comes up several times, we may have time to uh, pick it up at the end. Pre-read. This contains some templates and resources that may be useful for the breakout sessions. If you've not received your pack, please message Rob um, directly using the chat function and he will send uh, a pack to you. Um, a reminder that a summary document will be um, generated and circulated to you all in a few weeks time. So this will uh, aim to capture your ideas um, and your suggestions. And that's one of the reasons why we are recording today. And that's just to make sure that we are capturing your sentiment as faithfully as possible. Um, and finally, Blue Marine Foundation are also tweeting about this session today. So please retweet from your organization and help to spread the word. Right, that's all from me. I'm now gonna hand back over to Sam um, uh, for the first of our presentations today. Great, thank you so much, Diana. And um, yes, I'm just going to sort of start off with a very high level overview of the key sources of sediment um, that we know affect the Sussex coast and the potential impacts. And, and this is based on a desk-based review carried out on behalf of the Sussex Kelp Restoration Project by Dr. Simon Harding. And so I'm, I'm not an expert in this, so I'm very much putting this in layman's terms, um, which hopefully might help others like myself who are relatively new to this topic. Um, but hopefully it'll just get us all on the same um, sort of starting platform in terms of sort of the overall um, knowledge. So firstly, um, the movement of sediment from catchments into the Sussex coastal zone, it's a natural process, but it's been exacerbated by human activities over th thousands of years, starting from deforestation and cultivation of the land, um, which has increasingly made it more vulnerable to erosion. And in a review of sources and sinks in the Eastern England Channel between 1933 and 1957, five main sources of suspended particulate matter were identified. These are rivers, 
and you can see on this map sort of the higher loadings at the mouths of the Arran, Ada, Ouse and Rother on the, on the Sussex coast. Um, the second uh, main source was the erosion of coastal cliffs and wave cut platforms. There's resuspension of seabed sediments, particularly from the, the mid channel and an overall influx from the Western Channel. Next slide, please. A further study that was carried out by SCOPAC um, in, the, in 2012 really shows the general movement of sediments from west to east. Um, and, and I think this is probably quite an important thing to note in terms of where research is, is showing the inputs of sediment and how those might be moving generally from east to west. Next slide, please. And so, so since the 50s, really, there have been a number of further studies that raise some relevant points. One in particular that I thought um, was particularly noteworthy was this impact of rainfall, um, which is really well illustrated by the rate of soil loss and er erosion that was recorded from the South Downs, um, which was recorded over, uh, over 10 years, but shows a, a significant peak uh, following the 1987 storms. Next slide, please. And in 2015, um, Capuzzo and colleagues from CFAS and the University of Hull reviewed water clarity in the central and southern North Sea based on published and unpublished data. And they found that the water had become significantly less clear over the second half of the 20th century. And for the last 25 or so years, they've suggested that this is driven by higher concentrations of suspended materials in the water column with possible causes being a combination of changes in benthic communities, such as loss of oyster, habit, oyster beds, increased trawling effort, changes in weather patterns, increased erosion, and decreased sediment sinks in estuaries, such as salt marsh. Next slide, please. So added to the natural historic changes in land, land use, which cause um, soil erosion, there are an increasingly large number of factors the scale of which has likely increased significantly in the last 50 years, primarily linked with coastal development and climate change. And these include storm events, flooding, aggregate dredging, dredge spoil disposal, coastal development, loss of sediment, sinks and filters, um, and trawling. On this map here, you can see, this is what this actually shows um, from the land-based sources, you've got the co colored um, features of population density. So green is very low population, moving up to red with the highest population. You've got the outline of the, of the bylaw. Um, you've got the marine protected area designations in blue, um, the Rampion wind farm outline there in yellow, and that will likely double with Rampion 2. And then much smaller, and you, you've, you had this map in your pack specifically so that you'd be able to zoom in at your leisure to see where the dredge spoil dumping sites are. And in purple, you'll see the, the key licensed aggr aggregate dredging license areas. So really this just shows um, the sort of cumulative impacts and sources of sediment um, that we have to face today. So next slide, please. And just really to show in terms of what the bylaw um, set out to, to exclude one of those factors. This is just a, an effort map of trawling in, in the area. And you can see that within the bylaw area, there was trawling and that's now been excluded from the nearshore zone, but there's obviously trawling still going on um, beyond that. Next slide, please. In terms of the impacts, um, we, we've, in, again, in your workshop um, pre-material, yeah, there was a, a table like this, which actually had two further columns, um, and it shows the full range of sources which, are, which we've um, logged. Um, and so you can refer to this during the breakout groups. And it also has the list of impacts that have been identified through our desk-based review. I won't go into, into these now. Suffice to say, there are numerous known and potential impacts of sediment on the water column, topography, kelp, marine animals, and as a consequence, humans. And what we like want to achieve today is to get your input on this um, and get some any identify anything that is missing um, or that we can make connections in terms of uh, cumulative impacts 
and hopefully we'll have an opportunity to cover this and discuss it in the breakout groups and post workshop. So that's just an initial overview um, and I'll now hand back to Diana. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. And now we've got Professor Alex Ford, who will be taking us through his presentation. Um, Alex, if you wouldn't mind just saying next slide, please, when you want me to move it on. Okay, next slide, please. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thanks, Sam. And uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for allowing me to, to chat. I'm going to try and go through these as quick as I can. Um, what I'll introduce myself. I, I used to be a, a marine biologist studying the, the impacts of trawling on the seabed, so it's quite topical to the, the Sussex Kelp Restoration Project. Uh, but that was in the North Sea, and then I, I changed direction through my career, and, and I now study the effects of pollutants on wildlife. And I wanted to give an overview of some of the things that we're kind of doing in the local area that kind of broach the topic of movements of, of sediments, because those sediments contain pollutants and things. Um, so if you move on to the next slide, please. So this is a project that's recently started. And I, I saw Karina on here as well. So Karina from the University of Brighton is also involved with this EU project where we're trying to develop um, assays for looking at endocrine disruption. So we're looking for pollutants which might interfere with the endocrine disruptions of marine organisms. So that figure that you have on that slide is all the stormwater overflow discharges that can go into Chichester Harbour. And we know this local area really suffers from these at the moment and even kind of modest amounts of rainfall trigger these. Um, so there will be a lot of effluent and it's, people forget it's, it's not just the fecal matter that comes out of there. There's a, there's a lot of different chemicals which are quite harmful and we know act like hormones to lots of organisms. Um, so that's an exciting study and we'll be looking at um, shrimps, crabs, cuttlefish, bivalves, fish and, and all manner of organisms. And of course the entrance um, to Chichester Harbour there, we know that the current direction goes in the direction of the, uh, the, the kelp forests. Next slide, please. This is a study that came out last year, which um, gained quite a bit of media attention because um, this is the sperm counts of shrimp from Langston Harbour. And um, we know that Langston Harbour has a lot of impacts, but we didn't realise that um, the sperm counts from the, these little shrimp in the harbour would be the lowest that we'd record anywhere in the UK. And we've looked at some quite severely contaminated sites as well. And we, we can't quite put our finger on what the pollutants are. And like fingers could be pointing at those stormwater overflows. And, um, but there's also low lying landfills that we know could be leaching. And there's a lot of eutrophication and various different algae that grow that might cause harm to these. Um, that might produce chemicals which harm, harm these organisms as well. Um, so those things get mobilized and again through the sediments might be causing harm elsewhere. Next slide please. One definite example of where mobilization of sediments is probably causing an example is, is through historic legacy pollutants which are now banned but they're locked down in the sediments and one example is TBT. So we knew back in the 1980s that incredibly small amounts of this compound would cause female snail to change sex and grow a penis. And they're called imposets, where the, the male sex is imposed on the female. So um, when I first arrived in Portsmouth, there were no dog whelks, and then they started to come back quite recently, but they've come back and they've come back in an intersex state, which suggests they're still being impacted by TBT. And what we were able to do is go out and do surveys in the area before and after they redredged Portsmouth Harbour but to try and fit those massive aircraft carriers in there. And what we did find is a slight, it's, well, what we did find is, is imposex is still very prevalent in our snail populations down around here and all the way down to Selzy as well. Um, and it increased slightly. Um, unfortunately, because it's banned, the, um, the statutory agencies don't monitor imposex um, as much as they used to. Um, but the other interesting is the fact that if you look on the Isle of Wight, right down on the south near Ventnor, almost half of the animals are imposex down there. Um, but there's not huge boating activity down there, but there is a lot of dredge spoil that gets dumped around that coast as well, which may wash around there, may not, and we don't know the answer to that. Next slide, please. 
I mentioned about a lot of the low-lying landfills. This is just a map of um, the sort of Portsmouth area and everything in blue is a historic landfill. And many of these, we don't know what went into them because it was before time when they had to know and record what went into them. So there's probably lots of historic chemicals in there, which may leach out in the future if we don't stop um, the increase in, or prevent the, um, the, the rising tides and the um, sea level rises. And the bottom graph is a, a conservative estimate of where the sea level will be in 100 at the end of the century. Uh, so we've recently uh, written an article on, on the risk of those leaching out contaminants. And one of those contaminants that we're concerned about is on the next slide. So a study that came out um, by Zoological Society of London last year looked at the testes size of porpoises around our coasts. And they found that there was a correlation between the PCBs in the animals and the size of their testes. Um, and one of the other things that's been found in humans and lots of animals is that there are reproductive abnormalities. Um, and you might not be able to see it in the figure here, but the arrows uh, on those two porpoises are, are pointing towards um, their, their bottom and their genitals. And that gets smaller in relation to plastic chemical exposure in humans and correlates with low sperm counts in rats and mice. Um, so we're going to be looking at the morphometrics of porpoises um, washed up and how they, their, their reproductive anatomy correlates with various different pollutants. Uh, and that starts in October this year with um, the collaboration with the Zoological Society of London, which uh, I think will be a very interesting project. And that is all of my slides. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much. Um, and now over to Dr. Mark Tupper. Hi, everybody. Thanks very much. Um, next slide, please. I'm going to be very brief because I'm quite new to uh, the Portsmouth area. Um, and I have been working primarily in um, the Northwestern Atlantic off the East Coast of Canada and uh, in the Caribbean and Southeast Asia. But a lot of what I'm gonna talk about, I think is, is very relevant to here. Um, so a, a lot of what I've done involves um, looking at essential fish habitat, especially nursery habitats for commercial fish species. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this slide just shows uh, some of the things that I've done, um, mostly involving mapping um, essential nursery habitats for various species. So I worked with uh, Atlantic cod and cunner, which is a ras, sort of like ballon ras. And uh, I've worked a lot with groupers. Um, one of the um, projects I worked on in Palau was looking at the impacts of sedimentation from a coastal ring road around, uh, around the island that was being built. Um, the groupers that I was looking at they usually either, as juveniles, recruit to clean coral rubble or to macroalgal forests, similar to kelp, but uh, more typically things like uh, sargassum. And um, when these, these habitats become heavily sedimented, we actually see a decrease not only in the amount of uh, larval fish they'll be settling out of the plankton, but also in their growth and survival as well. So make a long story short, sedimentation is very bad for uh, juvenile fish. Um, and in fact, some areas where the ring road was being created, uh, we just lost hectares of, uh, of nursery habitat and there was, there was no recruitment of, of groupers at all. Uh, a lot of these studies involve um, mark recapture studies and uh, we're able to do this with very small fish using something called visible implant elastomer which is a, an elastomer tag you actually inject under the skin of the fish. And this is something that I'm, I'm hoping to start doing um, here in Portsmouth, looking at uh, where the nursery habitats are um, off the, the Sussex and, and Hampshire coasts, and, and particularly um, around areas of known former kelp beds or inshore around seagrass beds and, and other vegetated habitats. Next slide, please. Uh, another project I've been working on, I'll just mention this very briefly, mining impacts in the Philippines, uh, they cause huge amounts of sediment and, uh, you know, can, can choke reefs and again, um, damage fish habitat and, and that causes problems with uh, fishery yields. 
Um, could see similar things happening here, not necessarily with mining, but with other types of coastal development. Next slide, please. So one of the things that I uh, want to start doing soon is looking at um, identifying and uh, mapping essential fish habitat, especially nursery habitats for important fish species um, along the Sussex coast and uh, probably starting with European sea bass and ballinrass. And one way to do this um, is to look at the influx of fish larvae in order to know whether or not habitats um, along this coast are important for fish and, and whether uh, sedimentation of those habitats will have a large impact on the fishery is to look at influx of um, larval and, and post-larval fish. So we do this using channel nets that are anchored in the ocean have a, an anchor on the bottom, a float at the top, so that they um, sort of hang in the mid-water column and uh, they just fish on the tide. So you, you typically would put these in, in tidal channels um, leading to inshore bays and uh, they just spin around with the tide and, and fish it. And great way to catch lots of, uh, of um, ichthyoplankton. And then also, as I said, doing um, elastomer implant tagging of juvenile fish to see what habitats they're using primarily for, for foraging and growth and, and what are the ontogenetic migrations from these nursery habitats, um, either out towards the kelp forest or if they're using the kelp forest as a nursery habitat, out from there to the adult populations. So um, at the moment, looking for a bit more funding to start this, I'm using some of my startup funds from, uh, from the university, but also looking for some other uh, grant funding to continue doing this work. And that's it for me, thanks. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, and now we're gonna hand over to Libby. Hi, hi, I'm uh, Libby Darling from uh, a local beach cleaning group based in Rottingdean. Um, would you like to click on to the next slide, please? So I've been looking at um, issues, rising issues that have been going on for many, many years now, dredging and sediment um, on our marine conservation zone, Beachy Head West, mostly at Ovingdean Gap. Next slide, please. Um, I've been collecting reports from, from local people for, for many, many years and listening to their fears and capturing their concerns. Many people are really, really concerned that the dredger from our marina at Brighton has been seen dumping its load at Ovingdean Gap. Restaurant owners um, say that they're no longer able to purchase fish that they used to be able to from local fishing boats. Um, here's a quote from one of our local restaurateurs. The May bloom, the algae bloom that appears every spring on the rock pool was far heavier and longer lasting this year than any other year. Local crab have been practically non-existent along the stretch and the lobster season was the latest in living memory. The majority of the lobsters coming into my kitchen show the signs of, being, of having been unable to lay their eggs, a black slime where unlaid eggs have begun to be reabsorbed, which I've not seen before in the five years of cooking local lobster. So that's from one of our local chefs, Ian Wilson. Could you, next slide please. So, not only do our local restaurateurs notice the change in fish and lobster and crabs, but our local fishermen complain that their catches no longer include lobster. They also report that the only crabs doing well are spider crabs. These fishermen have lived locally and worked locally all of their lives and see the changes in the ecosystem first at hand. The local fisherman ca have, has captured um, image of this dredging pipe you can see in the photo here. Um, and see the plumes of silt at Ovingdean Gap. And many locals watch from the cliffs and from the beaches, the dredger coming out of the marina and just pulling up along shore and just dumping. Um, and you'll see in the next video um, on the next slide. Next slide, please. Can you press play? So you'll see here the dredger, it's, it's just dumped its load and is dumping its load. I mean, it was taken with my iPhone, so you can't, you can't see the gray spoil in the water but you can see how close it is to the beach, which is just below the cliffs there. Um, and this is what people are, are seeing every day. Um, next slide, please. So 
so not only are we seeing a dredger dump gray silt we're also seeing on our rock pools lots and lots of sediment um, and over the last few years we're seeing lots of this dark sediment and lots of sort of sandy sediment as well where there used to be sort of the chalk reef rock pools which we, we were teeming with life next slide please um, so local parents find this black sediment sediment at Ovindeen rock pools whilst playing with their children uh, we've been we've been told that it looks like anoxic sediment um, but from descriptions that we've fed back to various academics um, they seem to feel that it it could be contaminated and because it smells and, and feels a bit oily um, and it really shouldn't be seen in the quantities that we're finding it at, at at the surface you can see here one of our local parents has you know great handfuls of it um, if this is the case why are we seeing it in these quantities in our rock pools next slide please so if you could press play so we've had a local free diver. Thank you, Steve. I believe you're on the call today. He's um, taken this video for us. And he reports that wet years ago, the seabed was white chalk. And now this is all he's seeing. It demonstrates the issue that we have at hand and this sediment as well it's it's even on the sort of the the rock pools that are that are on the beach you can see the sort of slimy sediment it's not sand it's 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 but it's not it's not good next slide please so what we know Dumping of potentially toxic waste shouldn't be happening on a marine conservation zone or in any sea or water course. Local rock pools have been changing since the dredging and the dumping has been allowed to occur. And where once we had pebble beaches, we now have lots of sediments, but don't tell anyone we have sand. That's just not to be shared with anybody. Um, next slide, please. So lastly, I want to leave you with this thought. The time for action is now. The ability to make a difference is within our grasps. The public's growing reconnection with nature for health and well-being, our recognition of the urgency of the climate crisis and the government's commitment to a green recovery all create a unique opportunity. These galvanizing forces are strengthened by the government's spending decisions, new legislation and the 25-year environment plan. So thanks very much for listening and supporting me in changing what's fundamentally wrong in my local environment. Next slide, please. Thank you Thank so you. much um, for that presentation, Libby. I'm now going to hand over to Sarah Dobson from Living Coast. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, so my name's Sarah and I just want to share with you some learnings from the Beachy Head West Marine Conservation Zone uh, and the importance of a joined up approach, just following on from what Libby's uh, shared with us just now. So just a short background about the Living Coast. We're an environmental partnership brought together around our globally designated short block covering the Ada to the Ouse rivers and uh, three uh, environments of downs, towns and sea. So currently, as Libby's been describing, the marine conservation zone seems to be being impacted by increased volumes of sediment as a result of the licensed dredging disposal activity from Brighton Marina. Um, and you'll hear more on this from Andrew shortly as well. Um, we've had lots of feedback from stakeholders around the Beachy Head West zones showing concern of detrimental impacts and also loss of catch. Um, you can see the stakeholder responses on the MMO's website on their current consultation, so it's all um, free to access there. Um, you can also look at their methodology of their current um, assessment of environmental impacts and how they can also use a formal approach to assessment to conclude that there are potentially no impacts from the licensed dredging activity. So there's just a bit of a, a thing to flag here about not having a joined up approach around a conservation effort such as a marine conservation zone uh, and any other conservation efforts being launched in the region if there's potential risks from other stakeholders that could jeopardize the outcomes of that effort um, by um, adverse licensing or even licensing a potentially da damaging activity in the region. 
Uh, I'd also like to flag that this illustrates the importance of mirroring environmental regulation on land, particularly the application of the precautionary principle. So that basically means unless you have hard proof that the activity is not going to cause negative environmental impacts, then you assume that it will, hence the term precautionary. And I think in, in this instance, um, it illustrates the, the point that a precautionary approach isn't being taken if stakeholders can submit evidence that shows potential detrimental impacts and loss of catch, yet a decision can still be taken that that isn't the case at formal assessment level. I'd also like to flag the potential opportunities that we have uh, around um, crucial activities such as dredging that is required to maintain viability of our port spaces and marina spaces. Uh, and that's considering wider con sustainability considerations such as circular econ economy approaches. Uh, so we know that there's a global shortage of building materials, uh, for example, particularly sand and aggregates. Um, what could we potentially use dredge spoil for instead of dumping it at sea? You know, there's other projects that we could potentially learn from here. However, obviously, as has been mentioned in uh, Libby's uh, um, presentation earlier, we quite possibly have to consider impacts such as hazardous waste of that vegetable um, material if it's in the vicinity of moorings. So we've got things like fuel, oil and heavy metals and organic materials as well as other chemicals, as we heard earlier. So, yes, just really wanted to flag there the importance of us having a joined up approach across all the different stakeholders in this region um, to help us um, achieve a positive outcome in the long, long term. Thank you. Thank you, um, Libby, oh, sorry, Sarah, and now over to Andrew. Hi, thank you very much. Yes, I'm Andrew Coleman, one of the local representatives for Surfers Against Sewage. Um, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, so the wider context, uh, we represent um, all recreational water users and um, there are, uh, an awful lot more of us now since uh, the beginning of lockdown. Um, we've declared an ocean and climate emergency, which includes um, a call for the ocean to be put at the centre of the COP26 uh, conference later this year, and also um, for the implementation of highly protected marine areas uh, and rewilding, like, like um, the Sussex Kelp Restoration Project. And just to remind, it's the UN decade of the ocean, so we've got about 10 years left to restore the oceans. Uh, next slide, please. So the local context, um, many of you may not know that the disposal site next to Brighton Marina is a regionally important surf spot. You get up to 60 surfers there, particularly in the winter. Um, we've been raising, Surfers Against Sewage have been raising concerns with the MMO about the dredging for a number of years now. And as a result of that, we were consulted by the MMO on the review of the monitoring um, of the dredging. Um, uh, I'm a part-time lecturer at the University of Brighton and I asked um, colleagues in the Centre for Aquatic Environments to review uh, the reports submitted by the uh, Premier Marina's uh, consultants about the impact uh, of the dredging and dumping uh, on the mussel beds, and that will form part of this presentation. So next slide, please. So these two photos were taken by um, a local surfer in um, early July, and they show um, the impact of the um, of the of the dumping of the dredgings um, on the on the beach next to the marina. Um, and if you um, click again you'll see a quote from that surfer, basically describing the experience of paddling out next to the marina wall to get to the surf break through a um, through this kind of black sludge. Um, and, um, and the smell, as, as Libby referred to, uh, the, the, the smell of petrochemicals, um, which is in this sediment, uh, which has been uh, taken from the marina and, um, and pumped out to a buoy, which is about 100, meters um, off the marina um, and incidentally uh, part of the pipe used for that pumping was also wash washed up um, uh, in early July. I saw it myself actually later that day. So if you could go on to the next slide please. So um, going on to the University of Brighton report, um, uh, the two authors Dr. Mar Mariana Lima and, and Ray Ward 
um, uh, reviewed the results of the monitoring and also the research methodology. And I've just um, uh, copied some of their main um, conclusions there. Basically, um, a, a better monitoring regime is needed, um, particularly around the second control site that was established um, by the by Premier Marinas and their consultants. Um, more monitoring of the mussel beds was recommended um, and more monitoring of the kind of natural uh, variations as well um, over time and space uh, within the dumping site. And they also recommended that a recovery program should be um, implemented. Next slide, please. So um, our local surface against sewage response to the MMO consultation was that we had major concerns. Um, the impact on human health wasn't uh, even being considered. Um, and um, I think one of the previous speakers has, has, um, has, has, has mentioned that the possibility that you know, there may be impacts um, on, endo, on the endocrine um, functions of, of mammals, including humans as well. That's not being monitored at all. Um, the monitoring of the marine ecology was insufficient and also a kind of a procedural thing. Actually, in terms of transparency, it took us um, a lot to get the MMO to actually acknowledge our concerns on their websites. So we were looking for additional monitoring in line with what uh, the University of Brighton were recommending and also the inclusion of human health impacts. Um, in the long term, we'd like to see uh, an end to the dumping of the dredgings and beneficial reuse of of the dredgings that um, Sarah just referred to. And in the shorter term, given this is a marine conservation zone, we would like to see um, the dumping occur outside the marine conservation zone. And then the final reminder, part of our ocean and climate emergency, please, next slide. We need kelp and we don't think what's happening there at the moment is helping the kelp. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, we're now going to hear from Peter and Uwe from the Environment Agency. Yeah, hello. I, I think this is slightly different uh, to the other talks as it doesn't really deal with the sediment, uh, but focuses more on what, what we would be interested in, in terms of the kelp. Although sediment does come in because obviously if there's too much sediment, then there's no kelp. Uh, and, and the idea is that kelp uh, supposedly uh, helps coastal erosion risk management. Next slide, please. So what does kelp do for, for, um, for us? Well, at the moment, we, we, we don't really know. Everybody, and, and it was mentioned in the first talk, um, it's, it, it, it says that it uh, reduces wave activity, but does it really? Um, obviously, kelp comes in different forms. These are three that I was told are available um, in, in Sussex. And they obviously have, have different shapes, different lengths, and, and obviously that will have an impact on how it interacts with the water column and, and how it might impact waves. Next one, please. And uh, what still seems to be unclear, even after asking a few people, is, is what does the kelp look like in the water? Is it, for example, fully extended at, at high water and, and at low water, it sort of dangles horizontally floating um, in, 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 in the water, or is it just growing up to mean low water and, and it's sort of fully stretched like at high water, there's a lot of water in, above it, which doesn't have um, any kelp and therefore has very little impact on uh, the, the waves that run over it. So where is it actually, and does this depend on the type as well? Next one, please. And then, well, there, there would be a benefit if, for example, you go from, from left to right. So you have the present situation, uh, you, you get kelp, and then the kelp captures sediment, and, and the sediment raises the, uh, the ground because that, that might have an impact on the waves as well. But as far as I understand, kelp likes um, bare ground, so that's unlikely for it to happen. The alternative would be that, for example, um, in the more quieter water uh, landwards of the kelp, you might get a sediment accumulation and, and that might be of, of benefit. But the main thing is, is, is for us um, 
to, to reduce the investment uh, from an FCM point of view, you need some certainty uh, of that function of the kelp. And, and obviously the kelp grows in, in a cycle and, and so it grows in the summer and it dies off in the winter. But in the winter, it's obviously exactly the period when we have strong uh, storms that, that might rip out the, um, the kelp. So, um, and I think the fun slide, So another way might be, in terms of, of looking at, uh, at the benefit, if, if one helps the kelp by providing actually a growth medium um, on the seafloor. Um, this is just some poorly drawn rocks, but um, anything that, that A, improves the substrate and B, might also um, provide, uh, provide additional elevation, basically. So from, from our perspective, obviously there's, 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 there's still a lot of questions about um, the benefit of kelp for, from a flood and coastal erosion risk management point of view, from, from an environmental point of view, obviously, well, bring it on. I mean, the more kelp, the better. Thank you. Thank you, Ua. Um, I'm now gonna hand over to Jane, Jane Cunningham. Right, thank you very much. Let me introduce you to the CASM project. CASM stands for crustaceans, crustaceans, habitats and sediment movement. Um, can we move on to the next slide, please? Okay, next one. <laughs> uh, the CASM area of interest um, is, as you can see, it, it's outlined by the blue area that we've got here. This is where we're doing all our sediment sampling. Um, it was prompted a couple of years ago in response to questions from the fishermen is as to why there's so few crabs and lobsters and why is there so much sediment sediment and I have to say that Libby's presentation very neatly prefaced most of ca what chasm has to say because we saw exactly the same things though our sediment sources would have been derived from um, different places because um, one of the culprits in uh, in our area is oh just neatly covered by this square here it's just off the island it's the nab, nab tower which is a dredging point for our area and there are suspicions not proven yet that some the sediment slick that we saw coming through a few years ago might have originated there but um as far as uh, chasm is concerned it started with the fishermen and the collecting of anecdotal evidence uh, moved out to other sea users and uh, um, we picked up on their contributions as well um, the sediment in our area was sand initially, but there was also this layer of black stuff that we were talking about. Can I have the next slide, please? I've, I said I'd keep this one short. Um, so we were looking at um, our, our overall area and um, we thought, well, what are the actual impacts on this? So uh, a group was called together that includes a number of people who are in this, on this call today uh, and Channel Coast Observatory and Brighton University have ended up being the key people who are actually moving the research side forwards. Um, Portsmouth are just coming in now as well, which is fantastic news. Uh, and we've had some very interesting involvement from the Environment Agency just recently as well with regard to um, um, sond monitoring in um, along the open coast. Uh, the key chasm project aims you can see here, uh, a report is in, the in its final stages of being produced and um, Charlie has recorded a presentation to follow this one which will be talking about what's been achieved to date. Uh, we've been looking at sediment, we've also been looking at uh, more importantly the archive uh, records. The good thing about lockdown is it means that although people haven't been able to get into uh, laboratories or get out on boats necessarily, the huge amount of data that's scored in archives um, has been a good ground, good searching ground, just to find out what's happened over the last however many years and um, see if we can make any links, particularly with storm events. Uh, links with storm events and the things that we've seen with, in relation to crabs and lobsters. Uh, the report itself covers the first two points here, so to understand the changes that have taken place or to begin to understand the changes, we should say more correctly, and to determine whether the fishing grounds are likely to have been impacted by the re recent inputs. Um, next slide, please. Work in progress at the moment, uh, the Channel Coast and Brighton University, this is the CASM report that's due out shortly. Um, one of the things that uh, 
Channel Coast has been able to introduce is the capacity for looking at the coastline changing through satellite imagery. And that's where Bluco comes in. They've been kindly looking at Chichester and Pagham Harbours uh, and the peninsula generally in the company of other areas around the UK just to see whether changes can be um, uh, established. Um, um, my apologies, Jane, we're just going to have to move you on, I'm afraid. Just so no, we... sure. OK, <laughs> last but not least, the sond. If you look at the pickies at the bottom, that's what a sond is. Uh, we strapped it to a lobster pot. And this is what the water column looked like, picky on the right, when we first put it in. So not great. Anyway, there we go. That's some um, the start of the chasm project. And on to Charlie's recording now. Brilliant. Hi, I'm Charlie Thompson from the Channel Coastal Observatory. Um, I just wanted to uh, present you a sneak preview of the uh, report of the first year of work that's been undergoing under the CHASM project. Um, the area that we've been interested in this project um, is indicated here in blue. Um, it incorporates the fishing grounds around um, Selsey, Chichester Harbour and, and Pagham Harbour, which is indicated in yellow, and also a number of MCZs, which are indicated in red. The, um, the CHASM project has uh, five long term aims. Uh, the first year has really been focused on the first two of those. Firstly, to understand the environmental, physical and climatological changes that have been taking place in the area of interest, and then to determine whether we think the fishing grounds might have been impacted by any of these um, changes. To do that, we set ourselves a number of tasks. The first was to really determine the narrative of change for this particular area. So this um, timeline has been based on a number of interviews with key user groups, but also events recorded in the data or in the historic record to really just illustrate the amount of change that's been happening in this area. Um, this goes back to the 1950s and to determine whether change appears to be accelerating um, or not um, and link some of the observed changes with the data record. We also wanted to establish the extent to which sedimentation um, might have changed over the area. The problem we had here was that there wasn't a baseline of um, sediment samples in order to compare to. So the decision was made that we would set that up um, and that will allow us in the future to look at whether the seabed is changing in its structure. Um, we did that, we identified a number of areas um, which our uh, diving or other partners could visit and collect samples for us. Unfortunately, this was impacted by COVID and the laboratories we were doing the analysis in um, were shut down for a large portion um, of the year. So we are hoping to get back to this. You can just see some um, initial results here um, that just show the first few samples that we were able to process. Um, and we'll add to this um, as we can and hopefully um, do a, um, be able to carry out a time series of future samples. Um, we've also incorporated data from University of Brighton work um, measuring suspended sediments within um, Pagham Harbour and Medmory, um, along with a number of other um, environmental uh, water quality parameters. Um, and again, you can see more details of that within the report itself. We also wanted to bring together all of the existing data that we had at, at CCO to be able to assess the regional trends of coastal change within that data. So here you can see topographic data before and after um, 2013 in terms of cross-sectional area of the beaches. And 2013 coincides with the breaching of memory and also with the large 2013-14 storms that we experienced. And you can see here there does appear to be an increase in erosion in a number of areas after 2013. We also have some limited bathymetry data. This is an example from the West Witterings, which just shows the dynamic nature of the sandbanks in the inlet to Chichester Harbour. And we have similar data for memory, which you'll see within the report. We also are interested in the drivers of coastal change. So we have three wave buoys that have been situated um, in the area. Um, the oldest has been there since 20, 2003. Um, and at the top here, you can see significant wave height and at the bottom, the bimodality, the relationship between the sea and swell waves. Um, and there are some indications that, for example, significant wave height might be increasing. But unfortunately, the record um, length is relatively short, so we could don't have a lot of confidence in that. As the data grows in length, uh, we'll be able to tell whether that's 
a real um, increase in significant wave height over time. The um, wave boys also measure temperature. So we've been able to look at whether we think temperature has been increasing over time. Again, the does seem to be some indication this is the, the case for certain months, but again, the, the records are relatively short um, and we need to, to gather more data to have more confidence in these findings. Um, the past year of investigations raised a number of really interesting topics as well that we want to look at in the future. And this includes looking a lot more about specific sediment sources and contaminants. Um, using SOND units to get continuous water quality data and interacting a lot more with other projects um, to feed into this project. So watch the space um, and we hope you enjoy the full report when it's released. Um, a big thank you to all our speakers today uh, for sharing their findings with us. Um, over the last min 40 minutes, you've heard about the various sources and impacts of sedimentation, but also some of the techniques that are used to identify it, monitor and measure it. Now, in a moment, we're going to be in your groups thinking about the kind of data that you haven't heard, what you think might actually be useful in order to mitigate the impact of sedimentation. Uh, before we do that, just want to remind you that you have a crib sheet in your pre-read pack, uh, which might be some useful inspiration for that discussion. Um, now, you'll have about 15 minutes, I think we have overrun slightly, to discuss that, uh, the, the answers to the questions. Um, just so you'll be aware, Rob and I will float between groups to take notes and assist, so don't be alarmed if you see us appear, we're just there to uh, monitor. If you need help, just click on Ask for Help in the Zoom menu. Now, the first of those questions that we're going to be talking about today is thinking about your area of interest. Has any data not been mentioned that will help to inform sedimentation mitigation efforts? And a couple of Kickstarter thoughts there. Is your organisation working on something that we're not aware of? Are we missing any key information generally? And does any of the existing data that we have need to be expanded or updated? We're going to actually hear from each of the groups um, uh, just a, a, a quick flavour about what they have, um, what you spoke about. Um, each uh, person will only have two minutes um, and we're going to start in numerical order. order. So if you can start with um, Sally. Sally, if you're there, could you just give us a flavour of what you discussed? Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, yeah, no, it's a fantastic chat, but yeah, it was cut, cut a bit short, but, um, but it, was, it was really helpful. So, so the key headlines are being able to analyze the sediment from the, from the dredging to work out what's in it and the ecotoxology element. Analysis of actually crustaceans, many of which are appearing dead, um, that, for example, Jane has, you know, ready to go to labs to be analysed, um, to, to sort of pick that apart. Um, also, the fact that there's potentially a lack of crustaceans to study. So definitely a sort of link in with that. Um, also wanting access to data from grey literature from statutory organisations relating to licences and dredging and such like. Um, also further research into the beneficial uses of dredging. Uh, spoil and also sort of discussions about uh, when dredging has to occur and, and the impact on the ecology in the timings and, and locations of, of that dumping of dredging spoil. Um, lots of sort of the, the idea really to kind of really link up not only researchers and organisations but also critically citizen science projects. So we thought, talked about, um, you know, being able to feed in that data from rock pools, for example, from shore search, um, but also the free diving community being involved and being able to feed information in. So that sort of data entry um, from the sort of citizen science aspect being being able to contribute to that. So, um, so yeah, loads to loads to work from. So it was really helpful. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks. Um, sounds great. Okay, now back over to Sam. Do you want to give us the feedback on group two? Yes, of course. Um, so yeah, we had we identified really a, a few gaps. So as we went round sort of with our introductions, um, 
members of the group sort of talked about what they were planning to do or what they'd already had available in terms of data that we may not have mentioned in the presentations today. So really interesting talking about citizen science. Um, Anya from Mulberry Divers was saying that she's looking to um, draw on historic divers experience and create a photographic library of a dive sites going back in time, which I think will be really valuable exercise. That would be something very much that I think the, um, the partnership would be interested in supporting. And then the Environment Agency are clearly involved in, in a huge amount of work, um, historically and currently. So it'd be really interesting to draw that together. So they're developing a kelp monitoring tool. Um, they're producing a number of handbooks, including one on um, use of, of um, dredge spoil. And, and also uh, a joint work with between Natural England and the Environment Agency on rest, restoration of kelp, salt marsh and seagrass. And they have data going back many um, decades in terms of water quality which includes shellfish and fish data um, and also um, and seagrass and, and salt marsh coverage so again it would be great to sort of talk about how we might draw some of that together um, and some of their surveys will have included particle size in on the seabed so wealth of data there um, coastal um, well, Heidi Burgess talked about the monitoring that she's doing out of the Medbury in Chichester uh, from water treatment plants and the and agriculture and, and dredging, looking at pollutants in sediments and lobsters. So I think really the, the overall um, take home was that there is an enormous amount of data out, out there um, and that if we can at least try and map what's out there, we could then perhaps identify how some of that could be drawn together to link to the sources and impacts of, of sediment in particular. Fab. So mapping of existing data coming out there as being a really crucial next step. OK, now we're on to group three, which is Sarah. Uh, sorry, Jen. Uh, yep, that's me. Um, so, yeah, a lot of the things that we covered have been mentioned already. But just so going through the bullet points that we've got, we mainly went through what kind of um, key information is missing generally. Um, and there was a good point about it, it would be really useful to have a definition of sediment and how to distinguish between different types of sediment. So, for example, inorganic, um, organic, and where do microplastics come into this? Um, and what about like bacteria and viruses? Um, like it does it's obviously like the composition of, of sediment. Um, like it's obviously it's not just sand. Like so, what's in the sediment? There's a real lack of knowledge of like the composition. Of it we also talked about we talked quite a lot about like what was historically present along the coast um so like where there areas like we took like someone mentioned in their presentation with the landfills leaching like are there any other industrial pollutants leaching out anywhere um and built and just in general like historically what was the composition of of the sediment like historically um and one with that kind of linked into things like we've got some historical data on like where the kelp beds used to be from like an Ada and Worthy council report. So building on that kind of evidence base to build up a picture of what it used to, what it, what it used to look like. Uh, we also talked a bit about what the, um, the, the sediment processes are and what's normal. Um, one sec, let me just find that point. Um, yeah, so what basically what the kind of sediment process is like, what what should it look like? What's normal, like without any kind of dredging? Um, I think that was pretty much it for for my group. Brilliant. That's excellent. Thank you so much. Um, over to you, Sarah. Is Sarah? Um, Sorry, is there a candidate? Yes. You'd like me to go? Okay. Um, yeah, we, we felt we were robbed time-wise. Um, great discussion. Um, MMO uh, also appeared top of our list um, with discussion of um, whether there had been a review of existing licenses and also, importantly, future licenses. 
um, and we wanted to know were, you know were the MMO doing any analysis of what's being dumped and I think that's been covered as well by the other groups. Um, a really interesting one that came up in our group was the need for a, a 360 look at what was coming off the land and a, a real source to see approach um, which I think is not something that we're particularly doing at the moment that I'm aware of and I thought that we all thought that was really really good point um, and by that we're talking about freshwater runoff what's coming off the land what's coming in from our streams uh, etc and it was felt that there were massive opportunities to kind of overlap between terrestrial uh, and, and marine here um, and that there were a lot of uh, opportunities at the moment looking at sort of terrestrial soil health. If, if terrestrial soil health improved, then might that improve land uh, runoff? So, and then the last point that we came up with um, was a question about if aggregate was being dumped, could there be a better use of those aggregates? Could it be, be used on land? That was uh, one question. And Anne from Southern Water felt that there was a lot of data that was already in public domain on, on sediment uh, and, and toxins and things in the water. Were we looking at all that data? And Anne was going to post those links um, to you, Sam. So um, that's it from our group. Fantastic. Um, finally, over to Henry. OK, thank you. Um, so for our group, a mixture of academia, statutory bodies, uh, local authority, uh, we'll start off with the final comment from our group. You don't need a PhD to see the wrongs of dumping spoil right next to marine conservation zone. <laughs> so that just was loud and clear. Um, so land, uh, the connection to land, it's already been discussed, but it was, um, we were there with the Environment Agency talking about the need for kind of apportionment. If, if we know what, how much of it is coming off land and if it's specific catchments then there is the opportunity through natural flood management and all the other activities that are now well understood on land to do more of them kelp's not the only driver but if if it's demonstrated to be a driver it's a really significant one um it was recognized that sometimes you can um get more leverage in protected areas the kelp restoration area is not a protected area as such but a bylaw area but that, um, some of the lessons we learn within our protected areas can be extrapolated out. And there's an amazing example from Karina's work on fiberglass in Chichester Harbour, um, which is another presentation in its own right. Um, also, um, Adrian Worthy mentioned their relationship with the Crown Estate and that the, if we can supply evidence to them on the impact of sedimentation on kelp restoration, they would be a, a listening ear regarding licenses um, and also as been, has been covered elsewhere, who is licensed and for where when it comes to spoil dumping. And but as I say, that's already come up. So there you go. Thank you. Thank Great you, group. Henry. Um, fantastic. Uh, so it seems like a lot of um, great stuff in that first um, session. We're now going to head back into your same groups to answer a second question. This is moving on from that data question. This is really about collaboration. So uh, the key question there is how might we work together to use or produce the data that informs sedimentation mitigation efforts? And some thoughts there are what types of collaboration might be helpful? Is there existing knowledge that can be transferred? And how might we use existing or data that we don't have yet? And how might that be used in the best possible way? Um, so we're going to open those groups back again um, for you then to have uh, another conversation of uh, uh, probably about 15 minutes. Shall we go to Sarah? Okay, I'll try and quickly uh, summarise. Um, I think our group felt generally that, that there needed to be much sort of stronger comms between sort of uh, connecting 360, the kind of government bodies, the scientists and the general public, uh, particularly. Steve, um, our Bogner mayor, um, would like a roadshow that uh, really, a really visual roadshow that goes around all the local villages and towns, just kind of raising awareness of what we've got, what the problems are and, 
and ways that people can help, which uh, we thought was a, a really nice idea. And I fed the, in that the um, restoration project, you know, is very much um, on our radar to, to have a, a whole new range of comms going out. Um, and I think really that was our sort of uh, main point, to be honest. Um, and then Ray, felt that you know there was a real problem with raising funds for things that are not seen to be sort of as sexy as sort of climate change and, and that sedimentation was an equally important uh, problem that we should be looking at and should be looking to raise more money to investigate so you know because if sedimentation is an issue and is affecting you know our biodiversity and everything then then it is a pro big problem so um so more funding needed and how to to raise that and that's really uh it from us brilliant thank you so much um jen over to you yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, we also talked a bit about um, the fact that like new financial collaborations and more funding needs to be secured to get a lot of this work done. Um, we talked a bit about things like um, responding to the licensing for dredged materials, particularly ones in like MCZs, and could we use a group like the group that's here today, like a big collective group, to have a single voice, and would this um, would, would, would we be able to have like a bigger voice if we responded singularly as a collective group? Um, some, oh, going back to the funding, there was a mention of an environment agency expression of interest for the three Cs, which is specifically looking for examples of for things like this around restoration projects. Um, so there's a possibility that maybe the, the deadline's at the end of this month, so it'd be a very short turnaround, but just to mention it, that if there's any people here that would want to take that kind of thing forward. Um, so there was a mention of like more engagement from local authorities on coastal issues and in the intertidal area, that would be really useful to have more collaboration with them. Um, and coordination with, there's, so, there's quite high ambitions for a lot of this work from a lot of people and co just coordination of resource in all these collaborations to try and make the most use of everybody's time. Um, and then there was also a comment towards the end, which got cut off, which I think was talking about um, examples of like collaborations with ferry companies that used to collect data along routes, things like the continuous plankton recorder, I guess. Um, so like ships of opportunity. So, and can we develop collaborations with fishing boats to collect data in a similar kind of way? Um, and then in terms of existing knowledge, um, more work with fishing associations, there's lots of existing knowledge there, and also citizen science projects have a clear role, but as long as they are well set up with frameworks that will collect information that is useful. And that's it from group three. Uh, brilliant. Um, okay, over to you, Sam. Right, so we had uh, probably a few clear kind of points came out. One was that CPAS a bit of a missing link um, in this conversation. So they have quite a lot of relevant data that they collect to inform the uh, dumping licenses and approvals and set for those activities to track down the appropriate sort of team <coughs> or lead um, to involve them. Um, there's also some information that we could draw upon, which is satellite image data, um, which might show historic sediment plumes, just to show how things may have changed over time. But I think the standout point that came from our group was the need for clear information on who to report any concerns around um, dredge dumping uh, of spoil, um, if, if it's felt that it seems too close or it's not being done in the right way is is who, who should people, whether that's divers or local residents, um, who should they report that to and what's the protocol for doing that? And how would those um, reports be kind of collated and, and tracked? So a bit more uh, transparency and access to information, um, perhaps from the MMO on what data they have, what data they collect and how people can input any concerns that they have. And I think I've seen some comments in the chat um, from Lauren about that. So that'll be really useful to follow up. 
Yes, she has. She's actually said uh, that how you can contact her directly for more information. So that's great. Um, okay, we'll do Sally um, next and we'll loop back around to Henry after that. Hi, thanks, Di. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, some great, great input again. Uh, like's been said by Lauren's put information up there, but talked about specifically about contacting the marine licensing team directly and that there's, there's a means of doing that. Um, also, she's put up on the, on the chat the um, project evidence um, sort of information that's equally publicly accessible. So that was one area. There's also, um, we talked about the need for a lead on this, but obviously sedimentation is a, is a sort of massive issue, but sort of how you drive that and that sort of central means of channel of, of communication. And then from that, uh, we, as has been mentioned, that that the importance of communication and that that two way. So not only you know these these big organisations um, with potentially lots of data being able to hand that data over to researchers to to answer key research questions um, that maybe the public have want want to be answered, but equally. Um, equally being able for the public to be able to sort of feed into that and respond to issues that are pressing to them. So we sort of talked about the importance of researchers being able to use data and then convey that research in a way that's really understandable to the general public. And, um, and Steve brought up a good point about, you know, that outreach about being on the coast, about communicating to those coastal communities um, directly about what's happening. So, so really a big sort of comms issue, not only between organizations and researchers, but also with the public and the public being able to feel that they can feed into uh, information like, like Lauren sort of flagged up a, a direct way of doing that. Um, so that was great. Um, and, um, and uh, Jane talked about a, a good example of that was Anya Frampton at Mulberry sort of doing an outreach project based on on their research and things like that. So, so yeah, lots of, of, of food for thought about comms and really improving those those communication channels. Fantastic. Thank you, Sally. Henry. Hi, yeah. Thank you for coming back to me. So we talked about the need for a, a network, but as much as a, a people network, as much as an information network, I suppose. Um, a couple of people saying that actually meeting quarterly and updates on progress are really important and actually having those meetings pre-planned in the diary, you, you feel like you're part of something and you feel like something's progressing and the more structured and organised it is, the easier it is for people to take part. We also talked about some of the, the strongest comms and in, it's definitely in today's meeting come from local communities and local sea users and that we should really be telling these compelling stories because as a part of everything we've been talking today about today that is a campaign as well as research and evidence and information. Um, it's also pointed out that the sedimentation issues, I know today it's we've been brought together by the Sussex Kelp Restoration Project, but this is also not just about kelp. There is a whole load of other kind of beneficiary areas that aren't specifically about kelp. And so we need to make sure that we're linking out as much as linking in, I suppose, to those other areas where um, sedimentation is an issue. Um, and again, to come up, just a dedicated resource in order to do a proper job with this dedicated resource would be really helpful. I think that was it. Um, thank you, Henry. Um, so we've heard a lot then, and just to sort of wrap up, um, we have heard that there is actually a wealth of information about sedimentation um, out there, and that needs to be mapped. We've also heard that um, how sedimentation impacts kelp is a, an actual area uh, which is missing in research and you know how do we fulfill that gap. Um, we've heard a lot about how we can collaborate together and use those um, great voices from fishermen and from divers and from other sea users um, who are noticing these changes every day. Um, we've also heard a lot about how we need uh, much stronger communications 
um, between, uh, you know, not just the people on this call, but also, um, you know, other, the, the public as well, so they can raise concerns. So there's, there's so much there. And I, I appreciate you so much that um, we had such a limited time in which to talk. But I think we'll all agree that, that, that this is an engaging um, subject and what it's, it's done today has stimulated that conversation. And hopefully there's a lot more conversations to, to follow. Um, so it just leaves me now to say thank you so much for your time today and for all your ideas and uh, that's from the uh, that thank you is from the Sussex Wildlife Trust, the Sussex Kelp Restoration Project and of course Blue Marine Foundation. Um, I also want to thank especially our nine speakers today who uh, gave such inspiring presentations and a special shout to our five spokespeople who were able to condense uh, those discussions into uh, you know, four minutes of feedback, especially to Jen, who only found out that she was going to be a spokesperson about uh, two minutes into the meeting today. Uh, <laughs> so that's that's uh, all we've got time for. Quick next steps. We're going to send you a survey uh, to find out how what you thought about the format of this workshop today. Um, we're also going to be sending you that summary document in a couple of weeks time. That's all uh, from myself and Rob. Thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>